it's Jesse from Eco Method Interiors. Welcome to season three of Green by Design. In this episode, Erica is going to tell us about the elements and categories of sustainability and eco friendliness that we consider in relationship to any given design project. She will also be giving you a sneak peek into what we will be talking about in this coming season. Welcome everyone to season three of Green by Design. I'm your host, Erica Reiner. Uh, from Eco Method Interiors, and we are back for this year's season. Over the past two seasons before this, you have heard from fellow green interior designers, architects, consultants, manufacturers, makers, and many more. We've discussed everything from different approaches to eco-friendly interior design, human health, planetary health, and social issues that all connect and integrate within this topic. What are our listeners going to learn this season? This season, uh, we're going to do things ever so slightly differently. We're going to start this episode with an overview of the main elements or categories of sustainability and how that applies to interior design, at least through my lens. And then the following episodes, probably nine of them, will cover specific certifications that I look for to help me source cleaner, greener products and materials and go over the specific positive impacts that these have in a greater context. We'll also try to shout out a company, a vendor who supplies products with these particular certifications or attributes to give you some real world context. My goal with this season is that it'll be a little bit less abstract and um, theoretical and talking about problems, issues, et cetera, and drilling down on some of the very tangible solutions and my personal approach to what makes it the easiest for me. We in the past have gone over two certifications so far, the Global Organic Textile Standard and the um, OCOTEX 100 certification, which are both applicable to textiles. Um, We're going to go well beyond that into different kinds of materials and products and try and just help folks be able to find things so they can create that demand for better products. So here we go. Let's kick into categories or elements of sustainability. These are the things, the elements that I'm thinking about when a project is coming together. So you could certainly argue there are more out there or that these could be broken down into a more specific subcategory. Um, This is how I'm organizing it and communicating it to you all. And I will note that these are also super interconnected. Um, They bleed into one another. It's really hard to separate some of them out from each other because (laughs) we're talking about natural systems and a bit of science here in some regards, and that's just how the world works. Describe the different categories of green design you focus on for Eco Method Interiors projects. So this includes issues like waste reduction, raw materials consumption, reduction, and indirectly includes habitat preservation, as well as CO2 reduction and secondary market economies in the building thereof. So circularity, that is in reference to a life cycle or the circular cycle of any given product. So how is it made? What's its transportation like? What's its life like? And then what happens to it at the end of its life cycle? So being able to keep using things and keeping them in use out of landfills, out of habitats, all that kind of stuff. And being able to upcycle, recycle, all of those cycles is going to be lumped into the word circularity. And for an example, recycled PET plastic water bottles, getting the fiber reused and woven into something like an outdoor rug. So um, it continues its life into a totally different object that then I will source. The next category is resource conservation. This is something I think about that includes issues like energy savings, water savings, 
raw materials reduction. So anything like petroleum, wood, agriculture, fiber, whatever raw material we're talking about, and indirectly includes habitat preservation. So for an example, uh, let's take something like salvaged wood shelves from a tree that already had to be cut down instead of getting chipped and sent to the landfill. We're creating something of that wood. And so we are preserving the habitat. We're not buying new wood, so we're not chopping down new trees. The whole domino effect in relation to whatever resource that goes into creating a product and the product itself. The next big category is carbon dioxide equivalency emissions. The equivalency just means like different processes and different activities release different kinds of greenhouse gas emissions. So for instance, when you have a landfill and there's a bunch of stuff in it, it releases methane, not carbon dioxide necessarily. And those all have different atmospheric polluting powers. So to make it all one unit and easier, we just call it CO2E equivalency and it converts it all to CO2, what it would be like if it was CO2. So this is including things like product and material production. So the actual like manufacturing and things like transportation of the goods and end of life decomposition and incineration. So that would be the greenhouse gas production of a landfill that I just mentioned. And then incineration is obviously when you're burning something up and directly putting particulates into the air or decomposition, hopefully not into a natural habitat like the ocean or something like that, which we don't want to do. Also for CO2 emissions, I am thinking about things like habitat destruction indirectly. So for example, um, when we use new trees, new wood, that could be destroying a habitat, a forest, or anytime you cut down a tree, that tree no longer can absorb CO2. So that's an integrated connection there. Take an example, let's go American made chair. So for CO2, what are we looking at here? We're looking at the transportation of that chair to you. And when it was made, what electricity or power was that factory using? Like what grid is it using when they were in there making things and had the lights on and had the workers in there? So for instance, Grids all over the world have different percentages of renewable energy supplying the supply to the grid we're all using. Most of it is non-renewable, and those percentages are different everywhere. So approximately in the United States, and this is very different state to state, the USA has 20% of the power going to the electrical grid and being distributed everywhere else to the factories and where things are made at about 20%. For reference, let's use Thailand. They are at 15%. And Canada, they are at 67%. Go Canada. Um, caveats, things like, again, in the United States, something made in California is going to have a different percentage of renewables than the oil belt states. And then we're also looking at percentages between all the places, for example, the percent of production versus the total like gigawatt output. So just a couple caveats if anyone is interested. All right. So the next category, a very large category, something we talk all about, something that is very up topic in this industry is health and toxicity. So this is representative of issues like exposure to chemicals of concern. And beyond that, those are just the ones that we know about that we are pretty sure are associated to some gnarly diseases. There's also untested chemicals and both of these, you know, lists can impact the end users. So our clients or homes, but also the factory workers, the installers that are working on behalf of the end users and homes and offices, and indirectly people in communities where the production is taking place and their community and habitat pollution. Because let's take like fabric dyeing. That has to happen somewhere, and if there's not proper systems in places, all of the dye stuffs and chemicals that are introduced to fabrics, if it is not treated correctly and there's not wastewater treatment facilities, it just goes into the groundwater, surface rivers, all that kind of stuff. 
So it's not just, you know, what ends up being on your rug in your home. It's like, what is happening in the places that these are created? An example for health and toxicity, let's use global organic latex standard certification. So for organic latex for a mattress or for your sofa foam, that would be an example there of something that is going to have less chemicals for the end user, for the maker, and for the air quality of wherever this mattress is being made, whatever community that is in, here or abroad. All right, last but not least, we have social ethics. This includes issues like fair trade and fair compensation, things like appropriate working conditions, things like the absence of child labor, I'm including humane animal treatment in this category and indirectly habitat preservation. This is a fairly convoluted indirect consequence, but what I can tell you for sure is that people who have fair working conditions and fair wages take up less habitat resources and contribute less pollution to them, meaning they don't have to illegally harvest endangered trees and sell them on some like shady aftermarket if they have fair labor conditions or they don't have to go into a natural forest and shoot down some endangered animal species to cook up that night if they've got money to buy something from the market, the above ground market. So human and social issues like economics and social well-being are very much connected to environmental well-being. So that is the uh, long bow there. So social ethics. This would be something like for child labor, good weave certified for rugs ensures that the rug was not made from a factory that employs or uses children in any way. Okay, so the little percentages of energy comparisons, et cetera, that'll be in the show notes. Again, the categories are circularity, resource conservation, CO2 emissions, health and toxicity, and social ethics. And so those are the categories that I'm thinking of when I am sourcing, when I am looking to get something for a project, when I am wanting a client to think about considering something that was made alternatively with these things or one of these things or a combination of these things in mind. That's kind of also the piece that they're paying for. So I recently broke this down um, for a client and I thought this would be a good way to kick off what I wanted to share with you guys. And there we have it. So many more examples, many more certifications, many more pieces of this puzzle that I'm going to be breaking down into tangible ways that we can incorporate this into our sourcing and buying and styling and business practices, as I think that that will be really helpful for all of us folks trying to do better in this industry. So I hope to see you in the rest of the season. 